welcome memoir viewers and I'm going to put a disclaimer right here, right now. I will be talking about self-harm and the different forms of it, so if you're triggered, probably don't watch. But also, I am not promoting it. I'm just telling you my experience with it and why I believe that some people do it. Okay? Cool. So, self-harm. It is a bittersweet torture. And for me personally, the two forms, three forms, I suppose, three forms of self-harm that I used were food, cutting, and isolation. In regards to food, I use food as a form of punishment and control, and it's very complicated. It's another topic itself, so we're not really going to be covering that, but that's just one of the methods I used. Um, the second one is cutting, which is self-explanatory. I used to cut my wrist, and when I ran out of room on that wrist, I would move up the arm. I did try occasionally to cut my thighs but it didn't have the same effect for me and I was it sounds so stupid but I did when I self harmed I did it in a controlled and sanitary way sanitary you can't make it without actually yeah so the way I did it was relatively sanitary and I couldn't maintain the standards of hygiene on my thighs the way I could with my wrist, if you, if you understand that mean, what I mean. I'll cover that in a second. But also, um, I started to isolate myself. And you might be thinking, how is that a form of uh, self-harm? And it's a form of self-harm because you isolate yourself and you reject the idea of... I mean, my family didn't really help at the time. They were very unhelpful people. Um, so they would make me feel like I couldn't be around them because I was a pain in the ass or a nuisance or something or whatever you want to call it. But then... Especially when my friend, the person who's going to be watching this video, um, when she moved away, it became even easier to not go out. And so, instead of going out and exercising or seeing people or just having a life outside of your house and living there, basically outside of my room. I stopped doing it and then at first it was a choice. It was a choice to stay inside and just take the easy route of not getting bullied or upset. But then after a while it stopped being a choice, kind of, because I had trained myself to not want to go outside to the point of going outside then became the worst possible ending so I stopped wanting to go out to the shops to walk the next door neighbor's dog to just do anything and so I mean, depression didn't help with the situation. It's it's a very complicated way, but it is self-harm because even now, when I'm outside of school and you know I could go and have a social life, I've trained my brain to think, no, it's scary outside. We're going to get hurt, and so now I just stay inside, and I hate it. I hate it. Staying inside, it's, it's, oh my god, it's so boring. 
and I will be watching constant videos, random videos that I don't care about, that don't interest me, but I'm, it means I'm doing something. So yeah, that's fun. And it's like, if I, if I do have to go outside, it's like I'm having an argument with myself as to whether or not it's a good idea, even though it generally is a good idea, because it's usually, you need to go to the shop because you need to get some food. But then my brain's like, no, outside is scary. You can't do that. It's like being both the jailer and the prisoner. And neither of them have the same opinion. It's fun. But the main form of self-harm that I used to do, I no longer do that, is cutting. And when I say that I maintained a hygienic way of doing it, I mean it. I would wash the area first, probably wash it like three, four times, and then um, I used to use like alcohol san alcohol hand sanitizer to clear the blade to keep it hygienic. And and then when I, after I would cut, I would um, apply tissue and then wrap it up so that it wouldn't get um, germified, because that's a word. Um, yeah, I would wrap it up and make sure it wasn't getting exposed to things. And considering that this was all along this arm, um, it's very difficult to actually wrap a bandage around yourself and actually make sure it remains ret retains pressure. But I did it so often that nine times out of ten it would remain pressurised and to be honest it was quite often too pressurised. But at the time, the pain from the overpressure, the excessive pressure, was almost a comfort because I was in so much emotional pain that I didn't know how to deal with that I still don't know how to deal with that I would find comfort in the physical pain because it would be like well no, you can deal with this you can cope with this this makes sense, you know what happened here And then, and it wasn't as though I was particularly trying to hide what I'd done. Like, I would keep my jumper on the majority of the time at school anyway. But even if I rolled my sleeves up, people didn't notice. Teachers, students, no one really noticed. And it, it kind of annoyed me because I was invisible. I was invisible and my head was in such a bad place at this point that it was just... I wasn't doing it for attention, I was doing it as a method of controlling my own pain because physical pain, at least for me, and I'm pretty sure it is for quite a few people, it's so much easier to cope with, especially if you're the one who causes it. And so while I wasn't doing it for attention, when I was doing it for months at a time and no one would notice, it just made me feel even worse because it made me feel as if I wasn't worth anything because no one paid any attention. Especially my brothers. I lived with I lived with them. And it's not like at home I'm wearing jumpers all the time because it's not hot enough. It's not cold enough even. It's not like I'm wearing jumpers all the time. It's not like I'm trying to hide it because it wasn't something I needed to hide. Because I didn't have the stigma that being emo was a bad thing really. So, 
I was doing it. And I think because I knew I wasn't doing it for attention, I was just sort of like, I don't care if anyone notices. And so my brothers didn't notice, and or if they did notice, they didn't say anything. They didn't care enough to say anything. And so I tell it like there is one teacher that noticed, and then I had my form head of year. Yeah, it was my form tutor who noticed, and then she told my head of year, who then asked me, um, "I've been told you have scratches on your arm." cuts or whatever she said, I can't remember. And I remember telling her some stupid story about how I'd been moving the sofa at home and it was really old and so I scratched myself on it. And she took my word for it. And I don't know if that's because she's a teacher and she can't pry or whatever, but I've known many teachers to pry into students' social lives, so kind of bullshit anyway um but yeah no one noticed and then when I did tell my brother Judas watch the last video you know who they are um when I did tell Judas that I was doing it he was just like he would just use the excuse of People have it far worse than you. I had this friend who was part of the suicide hotline and it's like, he would invalidate the fact that I was in pain. Which obviously meant that I had to close myself, even not, even not from him. Because he clearly wasn't someone I could talk to. And then, obviously, when my friend, she went and moved away, I was even more alone. And it didn't help because at the same time she was also going through some dark shit. And so I was just alone with it. And then the ray of sunshine that is my sister. Um, when my brother would send me over to her to her house for the summer. Um, obviously it's summer. You're wearing you know tank tops and shorts and whatever. Um, she she noticed the scars on my arm. I would never cut at her house, just in case she ever watches. I never cut at her house because I was always too distracted. And also, you can't fly with blades. Just saying. Um, yeah. Um, but... She noticed, and it was the first time I was terrified to talk about it because I knew that she cared about me. So she noticed and she was instantly like, what's that? And I remember going, it's nothing. And it was the first time that I'd ever never want, it was the first time I'd never wanted to talk about it. Because at this point I had learned to, so I had learned to isolate myself and hoard my problems in my chest, in my heart, and keep them to myself and poison myself slowly. Um, and so she asked what was going on, and it was just like, I can't talk to you, I don't. Because at this point, also, me and my sister didn't really have much of a relationship, because she'd obviously been living in another country. And also, she hadn't really, even when she lived in the country, she and I weren't really, we were on polar opposites to the end of the age spectrum. She was really old and I was really young. So, <laughs> sorry if you're watching this and you judge me for it, but you are old. Um, but yeah. She asked and made me talk to her about it and tell and obviously she was like what are you doing that's stupid do, 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 you should stop doing that because that's what every sane person says they say don't cut don't harm yourself because that's what people who are mentally stable should think you shouldn't think about hurting yourself however 
as it was quite obvious, I am not mentally stable. Still not mentally stable. And yeah, so we ended up talking about it and she obviously told me not to do it. And I was like, sure. Didn't mean what I said, cause did it when I went home. <laughs> That's fun. Um, but then, yeah, that, that's my self-cut, self-harming, cutting story. But then we flash forward to year, the end of year ten, start of year eleven, and I'm it was like some weird like mentor slash friend relationship I had with quite a few younger students at school because they don't judge you in the way people your age do. Um, so they would come to me for advice quite a lot and I had this one friend who told me that she had start she wanted to hurt herself to cut herself and instead of telling her don't do it because chances are she was already doing it and was just trying to talk to someone about it I just told her to do it safely Because I understood what it was like to not be able to control the way you feel. To not understand the depression or the anxiety or whatever other emotion she was feeling at the time. So I understood that physical pain, especially self-induced physical pain, is a lot easier to control and to understand and to, to accept. And so I just told her to do it safely, make sure she sterilises the areas and utensils she's using. And all thunder. So I told her that she should just make sure she does it safely. And that if she did ever feel like she wanted to do more than just cut her, cut her wrists or whatever else, that if she started having suicidal thoughts then she should come to me because I don't want that to help. I... Because here's the thing, I find that most people, if they are self-harming, they are trying to avoid the thoughts of suicide. Because that's especially what I was doing. Because I was thinking, if I hurt myself, then I won't feel quite so bad. And obviously that's not entirely true, because when the physical pain goes away, you just return to the empty numbness, because I was so apathetic. I felt nothing most of the time, except from random spurts of sadness or anger. They were the only emotions I really had at this point. And people have said that that I was like I would ha be happy and it's like no I wasn't I was pretending to be because I started to pretend to be a normal human because that's that's what you do you don't want to talk about it you don't want to feel the things you feel whilst also wanting to you want to feel it but you don't want to tell anyone else how you feel it's just very complex, at least in my head, because my head is not clear even now, and I've been clean for hold on, about five years now. I've been clean for five years, which means I haven't cut for five years, but. It doesn't mean I don't want to still. I'm still numb these days. I don't really feel very much. I also get more bursts of emotion, but they're not just anger and depression anymore. They are also anxiety. That's another thing that joined in. Um, but they're also bursts of happiness that don't last very long because my brain just loves to destroy any hopes of happiness I have. But then I've also got like 
I also get these random bursts of energy and excitement and life. So occasionally, I feel alive. But for the most part... For the most part, um, I still feel numb. And so, to try and counter the numbness, I still want to cut. I don't cut anymore, because it's not... It's not what adults do. And that is... I'm sure they do do it, and I'm not saying you don't if you are an adult and you do it. But what I'm saying is that, in my head, it's inappropriate for an adult to do it. Which is why I refuse to let myself. Which sounds so kind of fucked up, but then, if you hadn't guessed, I'm kind of a fucked up human being. Hence the name of the channel is Memoirs of a Broken Girl. Because that's broken. And I'm trying to fix myself, which is the whole point of this channel. <laughs> but anyway, we're going off topic again. Um, as I said in my disclaimer, I am not promoting self-harm. But I do also understand that if you do it, you're no less of a person. Your problems are no less or no more of a problem just because you cut yourself. And then you get the people that are like, oh, they're just cutting for attention. And I mean, yeah, maybe they are, because I knew a girl who probably was, because her cuts weren't really cut. But also, if they are cutting for attention, then there's clearly something wrong. Because, as I said, no mentally stable person wants to hurt themselves. It's just not human. It's not... It's not a living, breathing existence to have if you are mentally stable. Animals in, animals in the wild don't self-harm. Except in the case of self-preservation, where they can lose body parts, but that's a whole different matter. But then you get animals that are captured and kept in cages, they start harming themselves because they're in a stressed out situation. And it's just... You don't harm yourself, even for attention, unless you are mentally unstable, which means you need help. So even if you do think that your friend is cutting for attention, or, I don't know, starving for attention? I don't know anything else other than cutting for attention, but I'm pretty sure there are, because there's like 50 different types of self-harm. If your friend or someone you know is cutting for attention or doing anything self-damaging for attention, try and help them. Don't just be like, oh, they're just doing it for attention, because sure, maybe they are doing it for attention, but that clearly means there's something wrong with them. So ask them how their day goes. Ask them what's bothering them. Don't just judge them, because judging people doesn't help any situation at all. So yeah, this is my PSA for self-harming. It's, don't do it, but if you do do it, do it carefully. Not promoting it, but I did it myself, so I can't, you know, I can't say don't do it, because then it's a critical thing. But also, people get addicted to the pain they bring on themselves, because the pain they bring, them, the pain they bring on themselves, they, they start to think that if they're the ones controlling it, then they're the ones who can make it stop. But as I said, you get addicted to it. And so even when you... <laughs> even when you feel better, you don't really stop. Because it becomes an ingrained behaviour and it's just you keep doing it and doing it and doing it and then you try and stop and then you can't because you just do it again and it is like an addiction you do have to get help to stop doing it 
so that's my PSA on self-harming. Peace out. And I will see you in the next vlog. Goodbye.